Well, to come to this final section now of how do we deal with iron overload in the liver and what treatment, if any, and what type of treatment will be most appropriate for our patients. It depends very much on the underlying cause of iron overload as to what optimal treatment we have for our probands and other detective cases. What is the best form of rapid and safe iron removal? And what is the appropriate follow-up that we should be offering with maintenance management for our patients with iron overload? Now, I have to include in this section here this other set of categories of secondary iron overload, because in our offices, we're often faced with some confounding iron evaluations in patients with hepatitis, in patients with alcoholic liver disease, in the rarer condition of porphyria cutanea tarda, in the very common condition of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and in individuals who've undergone surgical portocaval shunts. Here's an example of a patient with alcoholic liver disease in which the biopsy has been stained with Pearl's Prussian blue stain for hemosiderin iron. And you'll see that this is also fully developed cirrhosis and fairly considerable amounts of hemosiderin deposited in these regenerative nodules. Does this patient have hemochromatosis? How severe is that iron overload? And does it require treatment as well as withdrawal from alcohol? Here we see an individual with fatty liver disease, quite common in the metabolic syndrome that we're seeing almost as an epidemic here in North America. And here you can see the iron stain for Pearl's Prussian Blue showing granules of hemosiderin in an individual who has been diagnosed with fatty liver disease. Does this individual have significant iron overload? And quite commonly, these individuals with fatty liver disease have actually presented with enormously elevated serum ferritin that has led the clinician to suspect that they may indeed have a form of hereditary hemochromatosis. Well, in actual fact, when we come to measure the iron in the liver, and this is a study of individuals with chronic hepatitis, mostly hepatitis C, in which the hepatic iron concentration on the horizontal axis, the normal upper limit being about 33, is then related to the serum ferritin, in this case the serum ferritin transaminase ratio. And you'll see that although the vast majority have levels of liver iron lower than that 33 cut off for the normal upper limit, there are two or three there that have quite, and this is a logarithmic scale by the way, have extensively iron accumulation in their livers. Was this related to the underlying liver disease, the hepatitis in this particular case? Well, it turns out that when these individuals underwent the genotypic evaluation, looking for the gene mutation, that those two individuals there happened to coincidentally have C282Y, homozygous hereditary hemochromatosis. So they could be taken out of the equation when it came to deciding whether chronic hepatitis led to levels of iron overload comparable to that seen in genetic hemochromatosis. Because apparently without that gene mutation, the levels of iron in the liver rarely but rarely reached the sort of level you see in genetic hemochromatosis. But on the stainable iron, on the biopsy, there was that suspicion. So the shared features that we often see in individuals with other forms of chronic liver disease as to whether they have true iron overload often comes down to the fact that stainable iron is disproportionately increased compared to the quantitative iron as measured biochemically. And rarely do they have total iron stores more than five grams, which is more than five times the upper limit of normal. And as I showed you in hereditary hemochromatosis, that is rarely associated with cirrhosis. The serum ferritin, which often leads us astray here, is disproportionately increased compared to the liver iron concentration. Nevertheless, the level of serum ferritin may be predictive 
of fibrosis, and it raises these other questions, which I'll say in advance have not yet been answered by any randomized controlled trials. Iron depletion in some circumstances may be useful as an adjuvant in treatment of those conditions, particularly here, reduction of the skin rash in Porphyria cutanea tarda, or reduction in liver enzymes in hepatitis C and fatty liver disease. The big question which is unanswered at this point of time is whether the reduction of iron in these individuals has any benefit in terms of fibrosis and ultimately in survival outcome. Those have not been answered, and we'll need controlled studies in order to answer those questions. So the major unanswered questions in chronic liver disease, not that of homozygous hemochromatosis, will be would removal of excessive iron by phlebotomy or by chelation therapy be a useful therapeutic tool for the prevention of progression to fibrosis and cirrhosis, and ultimately to prevent development of liver cancer, which is exclusively seen in individuals with fully developed cirrhosis? Here's another interesting question. Would mechanisms to promote hepcidin synthesis or to increase blood levels of hepcidin, the suppressor protein produced by the liver, would that be a valuable tool in the prevention of iron overload? And as I indicated before, the answers will only come by randomized controlled multicenter studies conducted on an international basis. How do we go about this simple technique for removing iron? And this has been known since the 1930s. It actually was first described here in Cleveland, interestingly enough, by a hematologist over at a Cleveland Metro General Hospital, who first used, Dr. Davis was his name, who first used therapeutic phlebotomy for the management of hereditary hemochromatosis. And the basis for this treatment is that we measure the individual's starting hematocrit. We undertake initially in the course of treatment weekly or biweekly removal of one unit of blood, 500 mils approximately, and we repeat that phlebotomy on a weekly or biweekly basis if the hematocrit comes back to within 10 points of the starting value. In other words, that we're not making the individual so anemic that they are symptomatic. We watch the serum ferritin and repeat it <clears throat> for every 10 units of blood removed, using the value of serum ferritin to bring it down to about 50 nanograms per mil, and keeping that level there with the assurance that keeping that level at this low, we have prevented iron accumulation. The requirements for phlebotomy vary from individual to individual. I know individuals who can undergo phlebotomy every month in maintenance and not become anemic. I know others who can only give a unit of blood every three months. That iron from the iron stores, those blue areas I showed you in the cartoon, is being utilized to make hemoglobin. <coughs> and the level of utilization actually controls the level at which the iron stores are being replenished. So ideally, a safety factor, a level of serum ferritin of 50, would be the best way to know that the patient is not reaccumulating toxic level of iron stores. <coughs> How do the iron markers look during treatment? Well, here is a fairly typical diagram of an individual who, over the course of 18 to 20 months, is donating iron by phlebotomy we're watching the transferrin saturation on the left. We're doing the cumulative iron removal as the straight diagonal line up to the right. And you'll see that the transferrin saturation doesn't really come down until quite late in the course of treatment. <clears throat> on the other hand, the serum ferritin, shown by the right vertical axis, the yellow line, comes down progressively with a course of treatment. And you can use that serum ferritin, and you can see it doesn't come down to the target level until about 18 months in the course of treatment. So this individual clearly has a large amount of excessive storage iron that can take that length of time to deplete and then render the patient safe from any further iron toxicity. 
How do we follow up individuals once we get to that level? Well, nearly everybody requires maintenance phlebotomy. If they've got end-stage liver disease, that has to be managed. They have to undergo, if they've got cirrhosis, surveillance for primary hepatocellular cancer. And if they have end-stage liver disease, particularly with the development of a liver cancer, we have to make decisions regarding the timing, potentially, of liver transplantation. Ideally, before we reach that stage, we'd like to have a sufficient time to de-iron patients by phlebotomy, because it is now known that mortality associated with transplantation can be related to residual iron not yet removed, particularly affecting the heart and other organs. So we have an approach now that hopefully will prevent this from developing. This is one of the first slides I showed you. Prevent the development of cirrhosis, prevent the development of sufficient iron accumulation, and prevent the development, from where you see the arrow, of a primary liver cancer, which clearly influences the ultimate outcome, even with transplantation. And these are the latest transplantation results. They were published in Gastroenterology in 2007 that show you hemochromatosis, both diagrams, fairly comparable in survival rates with other forms of liver disease that we transplant patients for. But you see on the lowest part of each diagram that the presence of a liver cell cancer clearly influences this to a major degree. It seems that the more we get to manage these patients, because it shows you in the right-hand diagram the data from 1997 to 2006, compared to those on the left, which were earlier data, indicating that we're getting better at managing these patients, particularly prior to transplantation. And we feel that the preparation of a patient given sufficient time during the waiting time for a liver transplant will also help to govern outcome, providing they haven't yet developed a primary liver cancer. If I may leave you with this particular sentiment, which goes back to a biblical quotation, because we have learned so much from this evaluation of iron metabolism that tells us a great deal more about the regulation of this important metal, and say to you, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And certainly, I feel sharpened in my own clinical experience from being able to witness the remarkable improvement in diagnostic techniques and in the overall understanding of how this important metal is regulated in our body. Thank you.